Welcome to the Urban Tree Festival and today's final in the series of Tree Rings webinars. My name is Sarah Shawley and I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Urban Tree Festival and Woodland Trust where our working campaigning for urban woods and trees. I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers, two of the Woodland Trust's urban site managers who will be discussing some of the management challenges they're facing currently on the urban woodland estate. I'm really delighted to introduce Colin Riley, who is Urban Site Manager for Lancashire and Greater Manchester, and Hannah Patterson, who is Urban Site Manager for West Lothian. Thank you all for attending this event. We hope you enjoy it. Please note that the webinar is being recorded, um, so there will be a chance to catch up uh, on the YouTube Festival channel later on. Uh, if you have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A and we will have time to, to deal with those at the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you again for joining us. I will hand over to Colin and Hannah. Right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, afternoon, everyone. As uh, Sarah was saying, I'm Colin Riley. I'm site manager for the Woodland Trust in Northern England. So looking after about 50 woodlands across Lancashire and Greater Manchester. Uh, and I'm going to do a, a 20 minute talk on managing ash dieback across the estate. It's got an urban focus, but what I'm saying could could really be applied to most woodlands and uh, I think it's quite it's quite a timely sort of uh, time to be doing this this talk because it's 10 years Fe February 2012 ash dieback was first uh, identified in the UK so we, we've kind of had a, a decade of, of dealing with this disease so going to go through what we've done, some lessons learned. Uh, so yeah, I'll take it away. Hopefully everyone can see my presentation. Uh, so putting ash dieback into context, ash dieback will kill around 80% of the ash trees across the UK. It will cost billions, the effects will be staggering and it will change the landscape forever and it will threaten many species which rely on ash. Uh, that's taken straight from the Woodland Trust website, and yeah, it's uh, it's quite a daunting statement, really. Uh, but we'll we'll explore that as as we go. So, what is ash dieback? A quick kind of crash course for anybody that doesn't know. It's it's a fungus which originates in Asia, and the trees that are uh, native to that area, so the Manchurian ash and the Chinese ash, uh, they they cope. They cope with it fine, but its introduction to Europe about 30 years ago has, has devastated the, the European ash, Fraxinus excelsior, because our native ash just doesn't have the defence mechanisms to, to deal with the fungus. Uh, so, yeah, not, not good news for, for our native ash. What, what happens to the infected tree? The fungus overwinters in leaf litter on the ground, uh, particularly on the leaf stalks. And then in sort of late summer, July to October, we get these very small spores. The spores are, are very mobile. Uh, they land on, on the leaves uh, of, of the growing trees the following spring, and the fungus then begins to grow inside the tree. And it basically blocks the, the xylem and the phloem, so kind of the water transport systems. And over time, it, it, it will it will cut, kill, kill many of the trees that are infected. Uh, we have seen trees kind of recover to a to a level, but very often then they'll they'll begin to go downhill again. So how can you tell if an ash tree is infected? We get the leaves develop in these dark patches in the summer. They will wilt and discolor. They are, they often go black. Uh, they often shed early as well. Uh, you get dieback of the shoots and the leaves, which is very very visible. So a canopy dieback, which is very visible in the summer, really any time from from June onwards through to August. Uh, we get these diamond shaped lesions on on the bark and beneath that bark, it, it, it goes a very brownish gray color and you get a lot of, of new growth or, or otherwise known as epicormic growth, which is a, a, a common sign of, of stress within, within any tree species. So yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that was taken at Pound Farm in Suffolk and, and you can see uh, the, the dieback within the canopy there. 
and that's the typical sort of wilting that you'll see uh, particularly on 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 the younger trees but unfortunately as time goes by it's now being visible on trees of all ages really and they're they're the they're the diamond shaped lesions uh which again you'll see and they're the they're the very small spores which are very mobile and and hence i think that the reason this disease spreads so quickly and Interestingly, in, in my part of the world, it, it, world in, in Lancashire, along the A59 road, which leads uh, out east towards eventually Harrogate, but goes places past places like Clear the Road, there's an awful lot of, of, of dead or dying infected ash along that road. And I think the, the kind of the, 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 the traffic uh, sort of keeps the, keeps the spores kind of moving along the corridor and infecting the trees. So there's been talk about natural tolerance and there is some hope on the horizon. Initial findings are, are suggesting that, that there could be a tolerant uh, a tolerance within ash. Uh, so, I mean, we, we, we may see a recovery, but we, we talk in, in terms of, of decades for that recovery. Uh, I guess the only kind of disease it's perhaps comparable with is, is Dutch elm disease, which uh, was way before my time, but uh, we were obviously kind of kicked off in the, in the 1960s. And still to this day, you'll, you'll not see very many uh, mature elm trees. Uh, but I know a lot of people say that the elm has a lot less, uh, kind of a lot smaller gene pool and a, a lot less tolerance. So there is hope that there is some tolerance, but it, it's a it's a, it's a complex issue, uh, and I'm no uh, I'm no kind of uh, expert on that. And I think in the meantime, we're we're obviously all left with uh, a lot of dead, dying, and diseased ash that we've got to try and deal with in our woodlands. So, uh, sip of water. What we've tried to do on the Woodland Trust Estate is, is take a balanced approach really to ash dieback. Um, so yeah, finding the balance really between retaining diseased ash trees for as long as we possibly can, but balancing that against the health and safety considerations we're, we're under is kind of the starting point for our management decisions. Uh, we do consider and aware that there is potential for tolerance to exist, uh, and as I've said, for, for certainly some trees do have the ability to, to recover to some extent or another from the disease. So really preemptive wide scale felling of ash is we feel detrimental uh, to the long term recovery of the species. And that's something that we, we've not been doing on the estate and we, we'd urge other people really to to avoid that where, wherever they possibly can. Uh, that said, the old it's health and safety gone mad, you jobs with, uh, which is something that's been kind of laid in my door several, many times over the years of work for the Woodland Trust. Uh, when, when we have undertaken tree safety work, uh, but the, the law kind of says that all trees on privately owned land, uh, the responsibility of the landowner or the tenant. So under the Occupiers Liability Act of 1957 and 1984 and the Health and Safety Works Act of 1974, we as the landowner, the Woodland Trust, have a legal duty to ensure all trees on our land don't pose an unacceptable risk to people or property, which is kind of typical legal speak because it's all quite woolly and difficult to nail down, really. But you kind of get what they're what they're trying to say. So uh, yeah, despite that, uh, when, when you, you undertake this kind of work, you, you sometimes do get some kickback from the public. So this was a couple of years ago, Nigel Farage, love, love him or hate him. He's, uh, he's quite an influential character and he's got a lot of, uh, he's a lot of presence on social media. So uh, a wood called 20 Acre Shore, which is down in Kent, it's not a, a wood I, I know at all, I've never been to it, but uh, it's a woodland trust wood and we some ash dieback uh, work say to it was being undertaken and Nigel rocked up with his uh, Labrador and was kind of 
very alarmed to see uh, all these trees being cut down and he made quite a stir about it on social media and he actually uh, to my delight the Kent News online uh, he actually said the immortal line it's health and safety regulations gone mad we must stop them and their eco vandalism madness so I think uh, I'm not having a pop at Nigel. I think he's he's representative of a lot of people that, that visit woodlands where, where tree safety work has been undertaken. They, they can obviously be alarmed at what they see. I think the difference was perhaps with, with Nigel, with, with his, uh, his social media presence, he was able to get quite a, quite a robust uh, debate uh, going about the work that was being undertaken. Uh, one of one of my woodlands, Dobshaw Wood. This uh, this appeared on the sign back in February, and I think it was a result of uh, all the various storms we had uh, over the winter period. So Arwen and Eunice and all the others, I can't remember. We 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 had quite a lot of wind blowing there, and then we also did a little bit of uh, ash ash tree safety work, and yeah, that was kind of the result really. Uh, obviously, somebody, a member of the public, was was not particularly happy with what they'd done. Sadly, they didn't try and contact us, as far as I'm aware, anyway, through official channels, but they decided to uh, write on a sign with a permanent mark. And the, the money talks bit's interesting as well, because that's often, whenever we do tree safety work, there's this... Uh, this kind of feeling that low low grade firewood is kind of worth a lot of money, and uh, it really isn't. But uh, yeah. So, talk about what we do do at the Woodland Trust. What what we do with with any tree safety inspection. So whether that be for ash dieback or or any other species, we we zone our woodland. So this is a, an urban woodland just up the road from me in Preston uh, called Midgery Wood. It's quite a narrow kind of mixed broadleaf shelter belt planted in the 1970s. Uh, happens to border the M6 motorway and a housing estate. And certainly uh, it bordering the M6 makes life interesting because there's quite a bit of ash in there. So the, the yellow, uh, the highlighted yellow areas are what we call our tree safety A zone. And the green areas are what we call our tree safety B zone. So yeah that's that's the b zone in midgery wood which is fairly kind of typical uh that's the a zone which is a lot less typical because uh that's obviously taken from a from a handy uh, motorway bridge uh which is kind of halfway along the wood but the the trees you can see there uh, to the side of the carriageway that there, there are the trees in midgery wood and quite a lot of those are ash trees and they're all very much within within falling distance of laying one of the M6. So that certainly is a wood where we kind of have to uh, be be on our guard for for ash dieback because obviously, if we did lose a tree over onto the carriageway, it would be pretty disastrous. So what we've done at Woodland Trust for probably the last five years now is where we've got woodlands where there's a significant element of ash so kind of 20 percent in the canopy plus we've undertake annual we've undertaken annual summer ash assessments and where we've got trees which are showing up to 25 percent kind of canopy decline epidemic growth basal lesions etc and they're within the a zone we certainly consider removing those and then the same for the b zone we're a little more pragmatic about the B zone because they're, they're more of a medium risk area. But again, where we've got 25 to 50 percent of canopy, canopy decline uh, with the, the lesions uh, and the epicormic growth, again, we'll, we'll consider removing those trees. Ash, outside of those zones, we don't assess those and we wouldn't remove those for safety reasons either. And I think the other useful thing when undertaking the ash assessments is it, it kind of get, gets a, a general feel for what's going on in the canopy in general and whether you might also consider as well as safety work, you may actually consider carrying out, say, a 20% thin of that woodland uh, to try and promote some, some natural regen, create some canopy gaps and perhaps try and get something other than ash regenerating within, within the woodland, kind of looking at long term 
resilience and future of that woodland. Contractor safety is well worth a mention. There's been some pretty hideous accidents. I'm not going to show you any pictures, don't worry. Uh, but there's been some pretty bad accidents uh, with ash trees being motor manually felled with chainsaws. The crowns can be very fragile and uh, operators at the bottom of trees have had large uh, limbs come down on them to, again, pretty catastrophic effect, really. Uh, so as, as a site manager, you, not only are you considering the safety of, of the visitors uh, to your woodlands or road users, rail users, whatever, uh, you, you're also considering the safety of your contractors and where trees are in an advanced stage of decline, more and more the kind of industry standard is to be using things like tree, tree shears or mobile elevated work platforms to deal with those trees. So if you've not got that option, uh, you need to, if, if you're having to sectionally fell a, a, an ash, then you need to kind of intervene fairly early on really to, to avoid that risk to contractors. So operational planning considerations that uh, anybody faced with this kind of work, I would recommend they think about they need to think, do they need a felling license for the works? And Forest Commission are normally very helpful in discussing those uh, issues with you uh, and whether, whether you do need a felling license for the work or not. You need to consider whether you need to amend any of your existing management plans. Uh, you need to also have a think about TPO consent uh, and European protected species, particularly bats, but depending where you are in the country, it could be dormice, whatever's relevant. And you also need to consider whether you need to liaise with highways or uh, for road closures or hard shoulder closures on motorways, overhead power line shutdowns, that, that kind of thing. And all that can take quite a long time. From the public perception viewpoint, I think you really need uh, a sound national policy outlining your, your organization's approach to ash dieback. Uh, if you are going to do significant work on site, you perhaps need to consider uh, liaising with the public, uh, you know, with on-site online information explaining what, what you're doing and why. Uh, public meetings can work. <laughs> I mean, they also can be time consuming and they can kind of go off on tangents, but a public meeting is worth considering on site if, if you feel the scale of the work requires it. And I mean, at the end of the day, you will get feedback from the public about the work. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that's a bad thing because the fact that people care about woods and trees is certainly the reason I've got a job at the Woodland Trust. So uh, yeah, that, that feedback is all, is all kind of welcome in the round really. Uh, and it's no bad thing. So further advice from the Woodland Trust, uh, this, this is an excellent uh, resource that you can download from our website. So it's a technical note, managing ash dieback, Woodland Trust approach to managing uh, ash dieback on the estate. I say that's, that's free to download and I'd kind of encourage uh, anybody who's got an interest to, to do so. And my final slide, I've, I've done this talk a couple of times now, it's kind of been criticised for being a bit of a downer. So. I sort of try to uh, try to someone challenge me to come up with a few silver linings. So whilst I'm not making light of ash dieback, it, you know, it, it's, it's not great and I wish it wasn't here, but, but it is. So uh, really what, what have been the positive things that have come out of ash dieback? So I mean, man, many of the tree press and pests and diseases that have come into the UK have been in, inadvertently imported often on planting stock. So, Woodland Trust has spearheaded the development of a UK sourced and grown nursery stock scheme. So that ensures that whatever you're planting has been both sourced and grown within the UK. So therefore should not be importing any weird and wonderful pests or diseases. Uh, I think now when people are creating woodlands that we're certainly advising them to. And I think that, that, that people now with all these diseases are understanding that kind of woodlands with uh, a limited number of species in the canopy are, are perhaps not a good idea. So, you know, more and more people are, are planting a nice wide and rich species mix, which will certainly make that woodland a lot more resilient for the future. 
Uh, within established woodlands, I think, again, opportunities are, are coming off the back of ash, ash dieback. People are realising to do a lot more kind of thinning work. I think the UK woodlands are quite undermanaged, and that's probably a whole different talk in itself. But I think it's been a bit, ash dieback's been a bit of a spur to make people realise that some some thinning work can, can be it can be a positive thing to punch those gaps in the canopy and try and encourage some natural regeneration, di diversify your species. And both the standing and the fallen deadwood populations are, are clearly being boosted by ash dieback. And obviously that, that will have many uh, benefits across the, the woodland ecosystem. So uh, hopefully I'm still to time and that's, uh, that's me done. So I'll, uh, I'll stop screen sharing and, and hand back to Sarah. Thank you ever so much for that, Colin. Really interesting to hear about management of ash dieback on, on the estate that you manage. Um, I think we'll take questions at the end all in one go. So I'll hand over to Hannah to talk about West Lothian. Hi there, uh, I'll just get this presentation up. Um, so hopefully you can all see that uh, there. So uh, I'm going to be talking about managing uh, challenging behaviours uh, on the Woodland Trust Urban Estate. So as uh, Sarah just mentioned, I cover the West Lothian area of Scotland. So that's in between uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And we've got a lot of uh, urban uh, conflicts, but also uh, a lot of silver linings, as, Scott, as uh, Collins also mentioned, that we can potentially get from these. So a few of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to be uh, mentioning um, cases of unauthorised felling that have happened on the estate, as well as fly tipping and litter uh, and vandalism as well. So this presentation is really just an opportunity to give some case studies and uh, talk about our own experiences. It's, it's, it's not giving any magic solutions, unfortunately, but it's showing how sometimes you can do uh, trial and error and learn different things from different approaches. Um, and hopefully if people are suffering from the, the same instances, they can take uh, these cases and apply them on their sites or, or try a, a different method and see if that works to help combat some of these issues or at least raise awareness um, of them. Uh, so just to give everybody a bit of context, uh, as I mentioned, I cover West Lothian, but the vast majority of the sites that I have are actually within uh, Livingston. So uh, this is a map of our Livingston estate here. Hopefully you can kind of see my cursor going around there. So there's 13 different sites in Livingston and each one of them is color coded on this map here. So you can see some of them uh, have one big block, um, but the vast majority of them are lots of small sections which have been grouped together as one site uh, for management purposes. Uh, but you can see there's roads, there's motorways, there's railways that cut through, and then there's housing and businesses and footpaths all the way through all of these uh, sites. So, um, and you're dealing with really high numbers of the public. Um, a lot of people uh, are using these areas to get to work, get to school, go to the local shops, uh, walk their dog. Um, so they're not necessarily people that will spend a lot of time in the great outdoors or um, and have a lot of experience in areas of uh, more remote places, but there's still um, is their opportunity to make the most of their local environment. West, West Lothian, but Livingston in particular, is actually amazing with the amount of green spaces they have. People expect when they see this map, or well, there won't be that much there in this little strip, but a lot of these are um, long established woodlands and with plantation origin, some of them are even ancient woodland strips. So they're actually really amazing to go to. Uh, and it's so unexpected when you find them. So Woodland Trust being able to look after these and protect them um, is a massive benefit to the local communities, but also um, other people to come and visit them as well. Um, and um, but they are faced with challenges. Um, so one of the challenges uh, I just wanted to kind of raise awareness about um, it's quite an, a new one for us, really. It's something that we noticed uh, during the lockdown um, that we were starting to get reports of trees being uh, felled without permission uh, on uh, our estate, but also beyond our estate areas that we didn't manage. Um, and 
in some cases it was because people um, were wanting to get light into their gardens um, or worried about a tree. In other cases, it was just a, an act of vandalism and people uh, were maybe bored from lockdown and went out into the woods and um, actually damaged some of the areas. Uh, so there's a mix of reasons, some of it deliberate um, and some of it uh, pure ignorance of people not realizing that um, it wasn't an appropriate um, action to take. Um, but obviously this is something that we wanted to try and prevent from continuing to happen and raise the awareness to other people that we this is something we were experiencing and we wanted support and help to deal with this. Um, so what we did was we created a leaflet to send out to all of the houses that uh, were on the border of all of the sites that we had. So that was 600 houses um, initially for us to send these leaflets to. So this just shows you the front and the back of the leaflet. And um, this was to raise awareness of this issue that we were having. And also we were able to speak to the police about it and they gave us a quote at the bottom there, which really helped to support us to explain this is criminal activity. We're aware of it, the police are aware of it, and it's not something that's gonna be accepted um, in the long term. And if you think that something is, uh, or even in the short term, if you think that something like this is happening, it should be reported. And that way, um, people also had the opportunity to like read on the back here about the reasons why um, we protect the trees, notifying people that there's a lot of tree preservation orders within uh, Livingston as well, so work should be getting permission, um, the benefits of trees, uh, and um, the safety element of doing this work as well, and uh, all the benefits of trees there as well, and also our contact information, so if people wanted to get in touch with us, um, they had a way to contact us there. And these were actually delivered by volunteers um, that worked with the police. So we also had that direct engagement as well. And whenever we got inquiries through, we could meet uh, them in person if they wanted to meet us. So that way it was just a multi-layered um, approach to engaging with our local communities. And it um, also gave people a sense of empowerment because they could read this and know oh, well, this is something that I can look out for. I can actually report this if I see it. Um, and this is what I can do. Um, and we did actually have people, um, if I just go back to that map, uh, for instance, one of the areas where we dropped a lot of the uh, leaflets was in this woodland here, because that was where some of the unauthorized felling was happening. And uh, somebody who actually lived in this area uh, noticed suspicious spelling happening in this woodland and reported it saying I had a leaflet through my door I just want to check if this is okay I'm not sure about it and then we were able to follow up with that uh, with the police because of a leaflet that somebody got uh, down here so uh, it has a wider impact than the initial uh, place where they live it, it plants that seed of people thinking oh okay maybe I should be looking out for this and um, so we've seen a, a, a positive response um, to this leaflet this form of engagement. Um, Going in a slightly different direction, uh, one of our sites that we manage, um, but this is something that covers everybody, <laughs> uh, is dealing with litter and fly tipping. Um, this is quite a typical example of one of the sites that we have, Ladywell. It's got housing right the way around it, roads, and this is a high school just here and a primary school just there. So we've got litter coming from all these different angles is also like a playground here so um you're getting stuff being thrown out of cars stuff being dumped over the garden fence from houses people walking through the woodland and the kids when they have breaks from school you can see a trail appear there's like a greg's and a mcdonald's down here you can see a trail of the rubbish um appearing uh so this was really plagued with a lot um of high levels of rubbish. Uh, so we approached a, a local group uh, called the West Lovian Litter Pickers, who are an amazing group. They established um, just from other people within uh, West Lovian who were frustrated with seeing the amount of litter around. They got over 3,000 members, individuals that go out and they pick together in groups or they just go out on their own. And they've managed to coordinate in a way that um, we can basically support each other and um, we'll uh, have them come out onto our sites and uh, give them a venue to do an event on and they will uh, help clear our sites up with us as well and uh, so they helped uh, establish this pit that we did with this local high school 
and they were really keen to get involved uh, so that they could use this as a good teaching moment for their kids and also improve the area around their school. And the West Oving Council has this agreement with the West Oving litter pickers that whenever they do the picks and do the events, they'll take away the rubbish. So combining all these different organisations together, within just one day, we were able to take out seven different classes with over 20 kids in each of them. So already 140 kids plus. Um, and then we had other volunteers that were part of the West Lovian Litter Pickers group. Some representatives from McDonald's actually came out to pick with us as well. Um, and we ended up taking out 113 bags of rubbish, two TVs, two chairs, a tabletop, and a deflated bounce house, which is just here. Um, so this picture really doesn't do it justice. It's actually like piled quite a lot in there. Um, and uh, the kids were um, really engaged. It's a high school, it's a difficult age group to actually um, kind of say get these messages across to sometimes um but even the ones who initially were uh, a bit too cool for school at the beginning not really interested in doing it once we got out into the woodland um they were really really interested um fighting over who was getting the most litter um and um they had really responded to just being outside but also realizing how much litter was actually there this was a day where Initially, when I walked out, I thought, oh, it doesn't actually look that bad. And we still got 113 bags of litter out of it and all the stuff that wouldn't fit into bags. So it just tells you how much uh, rubbish tends to be in there. But it was a really great opportunity for us to talk to the, the kids and the adults and the teachers um, about the issues that litter and fly tipping present, how much it costs and how much time and effort it takes to remove. Uh, and it created that sense of ownership on the woodlands. Like they were like, this is a place we want to look after. We use this all the time. We walk through it every day. This is our woods. Um, and uh, so we had that sense of responsibility and being able to work together with all of these uh, other organisations um, to drive this uh, message home was really great, showed that collaboration and that partnership. And now other schools want to get involved. They want to do the same thing in the woods next to them. And a lot of them are high schools, which is really a positive movement. Um, and because it seems to be quite easy to for primary schools to get engaged, but secondary schools always seem a little bit trickier um, to um, link up with in that way. Uh, but this is basically created a little bit of uh, competition, but also uh, encouraging more people to want to get involved in this type of work. Uh, another site that we have uh, suffered from something slightly different, although it has still litter and fly tipping in particular, uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, a different type of vandalism. So we had a huge section of this woodland um, from here, kind of southwards, which had a uh, health plant notice on it for larch to be removed in about 2018 uh, because of Phytophthora morum. Uh, so the larch was removed and that left a lot of open space. So that was uh, restocked. Uh, but after it was restocked and the um, protection was put on it, but all of the tubes, um, they ended up, um, a lot of them ended up getting set on fire or um, torn apart. And a lot of the trees got stolen to the point where whenever I came into post uh, late 2019, uh, it was like it hadn't been restocked, restocked at all, that nothing was coming up, there was no trees. Um, so we basically had to start again from scratch. Um, so these pictures here, again, it probably, it doesn't look necessarily like your typical vandalism, um, but these should after, um, since if they were planted in 2018 and it was still going, these should be kind of up and away now. Um, but uh, as you can see, there's not that obvious. This was taken uh, at the end of last year. Um, there wasn't really uh, much uh, happening within these areas. But since then, we uh, decided to restock, but try and take it in a different direction. So we didn't use any protection and um, we just planted them in a higher density, expecting that we were going to have higher losses. But what we realized was uh, actually the high levels of disturbance of people moving through was meaning that the browsing pressure was actually incredibly low. And yes, we may still lose some, um, but the percentage of loss was much, much less than what we would typically expect. It was less than 10%. It was potentially less than 5%. Um, and considering it was a higher stocking density that we did, um, that, that was really quite a surprise for us. Um, 
so uh, what that actually taught us was um, something that we probably wouldn't have necessarily uh, chosen to do by not using the plastic. Um, but it proved that we could plant without using plastic in these areas, that having these urban high, uh, highly disturbed sites from people walking through on a regular basis could actually benefit by reducing the plastic completely um, and looking at it from a different perspective. And people then came up to us and said, you said you were replanting this, it's not been replanted. And we were like, it actually has, it's just really subtle. Even these pictures, like there are stems right the way through here where it's been replanted now. Um, I wish I had a, a more up-to-date photo because it's all come out with the leaves and it, it looks amazing. Um, the trees have really, really got well established now after being replanted in March last year. Um, so they are uh, getting on really, really well. Um, but initially people hadn't even realised that we'd done it because we didn't put the plastic tubes on. And then when people actually stopped and looked, they were like, wow, there's so many. Um, this is great. This is amazing. But if we'd put the tubes on, it would have just been like a big neon sign. Uh, come back and steal the trees or come back and set the trees on fire or damage the trees. But people hadn't even realised they'd been put in that. Um, so it kind of raises these questions that sometimes when we're dealing with these uh, issues that are really difficult, it might actually be a case of taking something away rather than adding something in to try and prevent these conflicts. And we expected that we were going to lose some trees. So there may have been that short term loss when doing this method. But the idea was that in the long term, we would still be able to harness um, some of that restocking. Um, so it might be that some of the um, techniques you use, you may have a short term um, loss but a long-term gain and um it pushed us it pushed us to uh, try something different and uh learn from that experience now that we've done that we've replicated it in other areas and they've also been successful so it's actually been really valuable for us and um, to have gone through that experience um and also being able to uh do some positive things in the woodlands so both ladywell and eastwoods this year have had uh, events with this group called row and bank who essentially do storytelling through the woods so we've been able to take uh they have these events for free and we had uh, over 70 people at Eastwoods and over 90 people at uh, Ladywell come out and actually see the woods in a completely different way. As I said, some people maybe just walk to school or walk to work or walk to the shops and don't actually look at where they're walking or don't think about it in that way necessarily. So being able to host these events and they literally were taken through by these really whimsical characters on stilts or uh, doing acrobatics in the trees and uh, talking to them about nature, everything was very uh, based on what was on the site. They talked about the new planting um, and uh, really drew people in and made them get a whole new perspective on the woods right next to their houses. You can see like the houses are literally here and then there's these amazing leafo woodlands here. Um, so it's just opening people's eyes to um, a positive experience in the area and therefore uh, wanting to protect it, then going out and going, well, I've seen a bit of litter there now. I, I don't want that in this beautiful woodland. Um, so being able to create these positive experiences can have that long, per long term impact for people to care for the areas more. I think people really undervalue how um, how much engagement can really help to protect and restore these areas, because if people are engaged, if people want to look after them. Um, a lot of little acts uh, can make a huge difference on the woodland um, if they uh, have positive experiences with it. So as you've uh, heard or whenever I've been talking through the types of issues that we've been dealing with, they're not actually specific to the Woodland Trust, they're not specific to the West Lomian sites, they're not even specific to urban sites, people can get issues with litter, vandalism, fires, um, a, a lot of conflicts, um, whatever sites that they're managing. Um, so really the key is to try and collaborate where possible because a lot of us are dealing with the same issues and um, if we can band together to raise awareness about the issues educate people about the issues and also try and come up with strategies together to manage them and um, that's one of the best ways to do it uh, there has been a, a group set up called the scottish uh, partnership against rural crime uh, I'm not sure if there's any equivalents in the rest of the UK at the moment, but this is an example that hopefully a model that might be able to be replicated. Uh, it was created in 2015. It's got over 22 different partner organisations and they're essentially built to give each other support in terms of 
these are the issues that we're facing, how can we combat these, and really focusing on uh, just at the end of that uh, paragraph there you can say um, it's to coordinate drive a cohesive response designed to tackle sources rather than symptoms and that's really important if you can get to the source if you can do something preventative rather than just constantly having to fight fires all the time literally and figuratively uh, that can be so much more rewarding uh, for one thing it can actually be a better more efficient uh, way to invest time and money uh, and because so many of us are doing the same things, we're talking about the same issues, if we can pull those resources together, that can have a much bigger impact than us all doing separate things all slightly different. So um, that's just something that uh, we're really encouraging going forward, seeing where we can collaborate and create these partnerships. So just the key points to take away from this presentation, I'd say is if there's ever an opportunity to prevent something that is preferable to doing a reactionary measure, um, and ways that we can go about that is by creating these positive experiences. All of the examples that I've gone through today, uh, having the leaflets and um, taking people out on litter picks and um, having the events and um, not putting <laughs> big signs um, out to people to notify whenever you've done something um, that could potentially be damaged, then all of these things uh, in a way have a preventative element to them. Um, but also it's about trying to harness the power of people. Uh, we're so lucky in urban sites having that huge resource there and it can totally it can't be underestimated how amazing getting support from large numbers of people are. West Haven Little Pick has been an example with over 3,000 members. That's incredible work. Uh, and new people are joining all the time. People getting those leaflets and then feeling empowered to, to speak out and tell other people about it and raise that awareness. When you can tell people things that they can do to be involved and do something, have a positive change, that's much more productive than just constantly telling people things they can't do. So if there's a way to empower people, that should be the angle that we're looking for. As I said, collaborating with other, other organizations where possible. And a big part of that is the messaging being clear and consistent if you can. So the Woodland Trust has a Love Your Woods campaign. I'd encourage anybody to Google it or you can go on YouTube and look at videos about it. And it's just highlighting some of these issues that a lot of land managers are facing and gives you um, some clear messaging to explain why some of these uh, acts can be damaging and um, how to um, basically highlight and raise awareness that it might seem little, but if a lot of people are doing it, it can cause damage. Um, and that way, you're not reinventing the wheel, not rewriting the rule book, you're losing, using a resource that's already available uh, there. And most of all, yeah, learn from experiences of yourself and others. And even whenever things are really difficult to deal with and demoralizing, and uh, there'll be positive elements in there, like exactly what Colin was saying with the ash dieback. There are positives to be drawn out of all of these things. And uh, sometimes you just got to look a little bit harder to find them, but they will be there. So um, I'd encourage people to maybe just think outside the box a little bit and, and try different stuff. Not everything's going to work, but um, if we try and then we can learn what does work and maybe surprise ourselves and others. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I think Sarah's going to come back up with some questions um, potentially. Thank you ever so much, Hannah and Colin, again, for your fantastic presentations. It's really interesting to see the wide range of uh, management challenges that you deal with on your on your site in your urban sites and um how how you're addressing some of those it's really nice to hear some of the positives as well as all of the challenge that our woods and trees and uh, us site managers are facing and i think one of the big things that uh, i took away from that was um people the real importance of people and engaging with people and that i think hannah you said about education and collaboration um but that real kind of like understanding what the challenges are and how we can all address those and I think on on that note, it would be really good to hear from from both of you, really. And, and Hannah, I know you touched on it a lot in your presentation, but perhaps Colin, you could tell us you talked about how in managing our dieback, what land managers can do um, in terms of looking at the woods. Is there anything more that individuals can do? Oh, that's a tough question that related to ash dieback. Yeah, and as as that as we're out visiting woods, looking at woods, perhaps noticing ash dieback, is there anything that perhaps people can can do? 
Yeah, I'm not sure on that one because I, th- I think, I mean, for, for several years, I think uh, Forest Commission were asking people to kind of record sightings but of, of Ash Dieback, but I, I think pretty much, unfortunately, it's now kind of accepted that it's it's kind of pretty much everywhere <laughs> across the UK. So, uh, yeah, that's that that's 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 a really tough question. I did I did notice that a question's come in. I think from Keith uh, about Ash Dieback on the question and answers thing. So I could answer that one if you like. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, I, can I just quickly add a point to that question? Um, there is actually a way um, that you can volunteer with the Woodland Trust um, as an observatory volunteer, which part of that is um actually recording pests and diseases and then you would uh, get training in how to identify them and then you could go out and actually record them so there are ways and opportunities as colin mm. said ash dieback is is so far progressed that to, to the point now where if you reported ash dieback the land managers if they have ash on their sites probably already know that it's there uh, because it's just so vastly spread but one of the reasons why we know that is because people have reported it and being able to identify uh, pests and diseases early on and seeing how it can spread up the country um, because there's still more coming in there's still new ones that affect other species like oak processionary moth and um, there are other ones that we need to be looking out for um, and so that is a really good way if you're interested in that aspect um, you could uh, look into doing that type of volunteering and getting that training and going out and reporting on any of these um, pests and diseases that might be seen. Thank you, Hannah. I think that's a, a really good, really good point. And I think every conversation that somebody has about ash dieback, perhaps with a fellow uh, walker or, or dog walker or somebody they've met in the woods who perhaps doesn't understand uh, what ash dieback is and the implications will we'll all help to kind of get that message out about how how this disease is impacting our trees and I think that's a really a really point one potential follow-up I was going to ask around you know all the other we, we hear a lot about pests and diseases entering the UK and we know that there's a lot coming in um, so I guess it's an ongoing challenge not just ash dieback which is huge but there's there's constant challenges in terms of pests and diseases coming our way um, Thank you. Uh, so yeah, Keith Keith asked. Um, typically, how often would you carry out an assessment for ash dieback in a wood? Yeah, at, at the moment, the way most of us are doing it is 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 kind of annually. So if if you've got a woodland where ash is kind of a fairly significant proportion of the canopy, so I'd kind of class that as twenty percent or more, then we are tending to undertake those inspections annually at the moment. Uh, the best time to do that is kind of from mid June to to August. Uh, I mean, Ash Ash is notoriously late, and uh, I was actually out and about this morning in a couple of my sites. One of the reasons I was out was because a neighbour had complained that she had three dead trees behind her house. Uh, so went to have a look. I was a site over in in Accrington in East Lancashire, and it's basically three ash trees that she's got behind her house, uh, and. Whilst they probably have got ash dieback, they are they are actually uh, beginning to flush. They're beginning to come into leaf. So, uh, but that off this time of year, that often catches people out because ash are normally the last to come into leaf, really. And and people kind of, you know, compared to the other trees that might be around about sycamore, horse chest, stunt beech, that sort of thing, they think, oh, that tree is dead. So yeah, you, you don't, you know, there is a key time to do the inspections, and it's kind of around, yeah around kind of mid-June to, to end of August. So give, give give the ash plenty of time to definitely come out into leaf if it's going to. Uh, and we've been doing that probably for about five years now. And it is quite interesting. Uh, a lot of my sites, there's trees that one year, you know, they'll be looking not great. And the next year, even worse. And then the year after that might be the point of saying, do you know what, I think I'm going to have to take a few of these out. So it, it is at the moment, it's quite a rapid uh kind of you know disease trees can change within 12 months which is which is quite quick really compared to a lot of other diseases uh it, it's a bit frustrating because traditionally we tend to sort of check our a zones kind of autumn time because that's when you've got the fun- fungus out so that's often the best time to check you know uh for for a lot of the other warning signs with trees but you obviously don't get the fungus very much in june to august but you, you know it is the best time so that can mean you end up doing 
in a lot of certainly a lot of my woods end up doing two a zone inspections a year uh which what well, you know you're out in the woods so it <laughs> it could be worse but uh yeah it, it does take up quite a bit of time i think you've touched there colin on one of the pleasures of being a site manager which is uh despite all the challenges you, you get to be out amongst the trees regularly which is, <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's worse nice. things to do <laughs> Um, so we have a, another question from Nora, and Nora asks, and this is uh, potentially for both of you, um, are there any resources that link, for example, ash dieback or climate change related potential threats to different key stages in school curricula linked to the work of our uh, work at the Woodman Trust, uh, ways of linking very local to national and international agendas? Uh, yeah, I think, ooh, uh, again, it's a good question. Uh, we we do work a lot with forest schools so i mean I'm, I'm no expert when it comes to kind of what's in the school curriculum although i'm a teacher uh, my my sister is a primary school teacher so i could ask her but we do we do have quite a few forest schools up and down the Woodland trust estate so i'm sure that's certainly a way that we can kind of kind of you know bring awareness uh, of of things like climate change and tree diseases and the kind of challenge that our woodlands are facing move, moving forward there is a if you go onto our website or even again just google um you there are resources for schools um on our website um and um there's a way that you can uh, it's usually mainly based towards primary school um in terms of different tools and resources and a lot of it does talk about tree planting as well and you can get tree packs for schools and that's usually a good way to like introduce the conversation to people and explain uh why we plant trees but also different why we plant different trees as colin it was explaining having um those different species it's quite a nice way to actually describe the whole thing the whole context whereas if you just talk about the pest and disease and climate change that can be quite a daunting subject another thing that i would suggest if this is something that you're interested in including in local school curriculum and um, if you have the opportunity to either get a speaker in or get a class out those are the best ways to actually maybe include this topic if you've got any places that are near you that um, people could actually interact with the class and talk about it and show them examples on the ground we uh, as I said have a load lots of schools near us and they will sometimes contact us and say that they want to um, include uh, this in their session in one way or another. And we can either go into the school or they can come out to the site and we could talk about it in person. Um, and then that way we can make sure it's tailored uh, to some degree for what the class needs, but and makes it relevant because it's so local. Um, and you can answer the questions um, and give a bit more context as well. Thank you, Hannah and Colin, for, for that. Um, so Woodland Trust's Tree Tools for Schools and our Green Tree Schools Award are, are an attempt to engage schools in addressing and looking at some of these um, challenges and topics with their, with their classes. Um, so yeah, as Hannah said, I'd definitely uh, advise checking them out. But definitely that drive to embed uh, all of these issues in, in education, I know, is something that's really being driven more and more recently. Woodland Trust is working with a group called Students for Trees, who are university level students who are who are working with us to get some of these messages out as well and, and look at what they can do to, to embed some of this within their kind of curriculum with students. So lots happening. Um, we do have another question uh, to Colin. Do you have a policy about contributing felled ash from dieback wood uh, to the deadwood stock in a wood now that the prevalence of the disease is so much higher? If if I understand the question right, I mean it's not it, basically it's not it's not kind of a concern. Uh, there isn't there isn't any kind of guidance on 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 moving infected ash like there is. I think there is for say larch that's infected with phytophthora remorum, but with, with with ash it's so prevalent across the UK that you find to you know you you find to retain that that dead wood within the the existing woodland because it's not unfortunately it's not going to make a difference to kind of slowing down you know the the kind of, oh, the horse has already bolted I'm afraid <laughs> sound a bit negative but yeah there's no, there's no kind of issue with leaving that dead wood on site and in fact it's probably as I was saying, the end of my talk, it's probably one of the, the few positives you can draw from ash dieback that at least you can 
you know you can kind of boost the deadwood stock of your woodland uh so yeah there's no concerns in leaving it there and i, I don't think there's any there's there's any kind of legislation on, on mo moving it anywhere else really either so ho hopefully that answers that question thank you colin that's that's interesting and, and helpful to hear um final question for hannah you, you spoke uh, so much about uh thumbs up thanks colin <laughs> and thank you for the question um you spoke about you know the, the level of engagement that that's happened and and a particular example was the uh litter picking group in west lothian who have helped to reduce litter. have you seen a reduction in in litter picking since you've engaged the school in in doing so and um yeah yeah it was actually uh really heartening um whenever we went back we were expecting um maybe there to be the same level as again um, and we had um, deliberately tried to organize it around that event that we had so that the woodland would be as clean as possible for when we did the event um, and then we thought right well after that it will probably get back to the same level and it seems to have consistently been not completely clean but better than what it was before um, it was quite encouraging as well having like those representatives from McDonald's come out to help um, as well with the the pick because um, I think they automatically felt a responsibility but weren't actually when they were out picking they were like a lot of this isn't actually McDonald's stuff and um, it, it just kind of raised the awareness about like a lot of people assume that it's going to be certain people doing it from certain places but um, really it's a whole range and whenever people have seen this these huge groups coming in and all coming together and picking it and people would ask us what are you doing and uh, who's involved and you're able to talk to people about it and um, it spread the word it spread that message and I think then people automatically when you make a, a place look tidier and nicer people then want to keep it that way whereas if it's already a mess people go oh what's well, one more bit of litter um, whereas as soon as it's clear, people think, oh, OK, maybe I should just find a bin. Um, so trying to maintain um, that level, it's it's by no means um, an easy feat. But I think um, the more that we can redo that engagement as well um, and um, try and get uh, more people engaged, and spread the message wider, get more schools engaged, uh, more areas, they'll then talk to their family and their parents and their friends about it. And um, it, it definitely just seemed to have that impact, the word of mouth from people. Um, and then they are almost protecting the woods themselves. When we were doing the event, there was the kids on bikes and they were like, hey, I've just cleaned this woodland, so don't drop anything in here. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it has that knock on effect. That's really great to hear. Thanks, Hannah. And um, we, we're just coming up to two o'clock now. So can I thank all of our uh, participants for attending today's webinar and uh, for your interest and questions. Thank you ever so much to our speakers, Hannah and Colin. Um, thank you for joining in with the Urban Tree Festival. Please do take a look at the remaining talks that are happening throughout the, the weekend. Um, there's a great one tonight at six o'clock with author Paul Wood uh, on urban trees and some fascinating urban trees that he's discovered. Um, please do take a look at Woodland Trust's urban, urban sites and go for a walk around and um, we'd love to hear from you uh, going forward. So thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of the festival. Take care.